what's uh what's with the red mariner hat and the red <laughs> shirt i'm just sporting my red like the man. ultimate sport music trumpeter <laughs> trumpeter i mean bad choice of words because of the red hat but i mean <laughs> i like this hat it's comfortable and this is my- everybody knows that johnny is the is the opposite of any trump lover yeah. Dude, I didn't wear a red hat for four years, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to lie. This hat sat in a box for four years. Oh, my God. All right. Spooky! Spooky! Welcome back to Spooky Country. Come on in. It's time to have some fun. Get with the come on down. <laughs> yeah, come on down. Let's do this. Today on the show, well, it's it's kind of like everybody's friend, Bruce Valanche, isn't it? It is, man. He comes on and talks to Casey, and we got both Casey and him on video for you, so it's, that's a treat. Yeah. Nice. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, Bruce is on the Hollywood Squares. He's a writer for the Oscars. He's done a, I mean, the Muppets. He's done a, a ton of stuff, and he comes yeah. on and talks to Casey. It's a lot of fun. I mean, the guy is a funny guy. There's, there's a piece I cut out yeah. in the middle because they had some issues where Casey had to reconnect with them. Yeah, and Casey just kind of drops, and so it's Bruce by himself. And <laughs> it is, I cut it out, but I saved it. But it's it, <laughs> he's funny. I'll just say that. <laughs> awesome. Maybe we can uh, put it out as a blooper someday. Yeah, someday we have a ton of those. So. Yeah, I oh, know we got so <laughs> a many. whole folder full of those. <laughs> yeah, we got one with uh, with a current guest that we had on. Of these you, people know who who they are. Yeah. I yeah. won't say who it is, but. When we're getting on and they're getting on their video and the video wasn't on, he goes, they were like, hey, just give me one second. And they went away and they're like, you took all my meat. <laughs> I, was like, oh, I know who that is. <laughs> oh, I'm so hard. But uh, speaking of meat, let's listen to Casey. <laughs> speaking of meat. All right, yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> to the meat of the <laughs> He's a stud. Let's listen to Casey and, and Bruce in their own words. Oh, man. Spooky. I saw that. I saw it's that. Hyster- I mean, there's no punchline here, but I mean, it's hysterical. I mean, it's like, warning may contain offensive information. Now, let's hit time to like the light. It's time to raise the curtain. <laughs> All this cloth comes dancing out. And I thought, and there now everybody, every kid's going to be going, oh, what's offensive? Let me see. What's offensive? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I think people forget that they, they admit the Muppet right. Show to be like, in a kind of for adults. No, well, you know, like it was for, for the most it was, his family. I mean, yeah. I mean, I did. I've worked with the Muppets a bunch of times, and it's it's the Muppets actually do an adult show, which is which is they it's just a live stage show which they were touring before the Trump virus hit, oh, and wow. they it, it was it was all about the Muppets kind of you know going wild and being sexy and doing all sorts of stuff. But the the old the original Muppet Show was just kind of like hip. So it was like for kids, but it was for it was a, a prime time an evening show, and it was for adults and for kids. But what's hysterical to me now is that stuff that when we did the show in the seventies, we we didn't think was offensive. That's the stuff that's offensive now. You know, somebody coming in and saying, "No, nice dress," that's offensive. You know, that's harassment. <laughs> so uh, it's like. They're, 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 I mean, they're, it's such a minefield of offenses now that the Muppets are actually being, uh, are, have to safeguard themselves from it. So what, at, what can I say? As a writer, as a comedian, as somebody in the public eye, yes. do you feel like you're walking through a minefield oh, okay. when you're, Not especially your act, because your act is a, freaking hilarious. A with eggshells on top of it. <laughs> You don't pull any punches, and you talk about whatever the fuck you want to, and I love it. I do, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm not like wildly profane. Everybody's wildly profane, so it's I'm not. I'm just profane enough, I guess. You just don't know what what sensibility you're colliding with. I mean, it's just uh, and and how where people are going to take it. You know, I mean, I mean, in Canada, this this uh, disabled guy has taken a comedian to to court and won saying he was bullied by this comedian. I don't actually know the details of it, so I really shouldn't speak about it. But the idea that that could, that that could happen, that, that, yeah. that free speech could be so impinged upon by, by one person who feels like, well, you know, it, it's me you were talking about. I mean, it's, it's odd. 
Yeah, yeah. So the, it's, 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 and it's <laughs> uncomfortable, and it makes it difficult to, to, to you know, to work because you really feel like, yeah, you, I always felt like somebody was going to be pissed off if you're not doing it. You're not doing it right if somebody isn't pissed off because the idea of any kind of comedy is to make fun of sacred cows and to uh, point out the ridiculousness of, of things, and there will always be somebody who's offended by that, no matter what it is. So. When you when you first started, especially actually well after you started, when you were on the the Hollywood Squares, yeah, did you ever run into any instances while you were doing your live show where you had audience members kind of freak out on you because they'd seen this personality you have on you know Hollywood Squares and then they see your stage act and you you cut loose a little bit and it was it was too much for them you know no i mean i i've had drunks you know i, I think it's just people get drunk and that's one reason why i don't like to do clubs and my bad experiences have all been in clubs and I've, i'm not a club comic you know I, I i hate coming out and being comic number 14 oh, yeah. um, oh. roster, or even when that you headline you have to follow three people who are local and I, I, I'm, that's not my game i only like to work where people have come to see me and they know what they're getting and it's a theater situation so they're not sitting at a table getting progressively more plastered and 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 feeling that they can talk back to you yeah yeah i mean it's uh it's uh i just wonder it's, other people like i work with judy gold a lot and we do a show together big she's and tall. amazing she's hysterical because i'm big and she's tall and and yeah, but but the audience that comes to see us in theaters knows who we are and knows what they're getting uh, judy just loves to go out and, and judy's act a lot of her act is just going out and engaging with the audience but i don't do that i tell stories i'm, I'm you know i'm not a stand-up like that i'm a sit down i hear you i hear you so so how does one become bruce valanche like can you how, how did it happen well, you know it's one of those crazy accidents <laughs> i i think that i was i was encouraged because i i was i had very hip parents and i made faces a lot in the mirror and i like to perform and they they rather than saying oh that's don't do that that's bad go study or something they said they encouraged me they sent me off to auditions of things they didn't push me it wasn't like gypsy you know saying out louise they they just they let me do what i wanted to do and and i had you know i was a child actor and i made a little, a little career at it and all that but they weren't living off of me and i was never a child star or we'd be having this conversation in rehab <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it just it just kind of it just kind of happened, you know. And I always it's a combination of things. I, I was I was heavy, and I had a deep voice, and I wasn't athletic, so I had to come up with something so that people would talk to me or not beat me up. Because before we had you know institutionalized bullying, it was just one of the rites of passage was if you weren't you know the kid who could play shortstop, if you were the kid in right field, you got pounded because they knew you were no, you were no good. <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I got funny and uh, I used that as a defense mechanism. And one thing just sort of led to another. And I just kept saying, yes, I, I wanted to act. I wanted to perform, but I wasn't getting cast in the things that I was going up for because I was up against the real thing. I was up against uh, guys who were 20 years older because I always kind of looked older, even as a kid. And then uh, so I started writing because I knew about that. And it turned out that the writing uh, worked out. And I always went back and forth between the two. What What do you prefer? Do you Do you like being the the man behind the scenes, like writing the jokes, or or do you like actually being in front of people? I like being in front of people. I like performing. You know, I'm a performer. But I mean, there's a rush you get when you're performing, even if you're doing it on camera. You get a certain kind of a rush out of it. There's a rush you get when you're writing, but it's what I call the alpha state, where uh, you zone everything else out and you're just concentrating on what you're doing. It's very satisfying, but it's also very lonely. I do a lot of collaborative writing, and so I'm in a room where you actually get to perform and write. So that's a nice, nice combination. And most of the comedy things you see on television are, are done that way they're written that way there somebody writes a first draft and then a hundred people come and do a rewrite so written there. But, but one guy runs up the aisle at the emmys the guy who did the first draft yeah yeah <laughs> the great system irony their name is emmy so you early on in your career got to do some really really amazing stuff like you you wrote the some of the bet mittler show 
I wrote all of her shows. I mean, I, from the beginning with her, the comedy stuff, you know, her shows are always built around the music. Yeah, yeah, but uh, so so that it was it was working that in. It was getting working with her performing persona and and getting stuff and creating. At, at, after a while. And when they got more elaborate, we were coming up with sections, you know, of, of things to do, as opposed to just a, a concert kind of thing, where you come out in front of a, of the band and sing and talk. There, it's just from my perspective, it's always grating when somebody who is naturally not funny tries to do jokes in between sets during a show. Yeah, and so. It's when it's somebody like it's, you, yeah, <laughs> it's strategic. Then yeah, it's called patter, but it's strategic writing. I mean, you have to do, you have to find somebody that makes them engaging, as engaging speaking as they are singing with, with the audience. I mean, there sometimes you know you just you you just have to they 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 can remain kind of glacial and glamorous, but but audiences like when you connect with them, especially when they pay you know big money to come and see you, but. Sometimes, you know, it just when I first started, I wrote for Celine Dion for a long time, and she had started and she became, this is before Vegas period, but she had had a whole bunch of hit records and she was playing, you know, Madison Square Garden and places like that. And she had done this, a, a few albums, and it was a new album that she had put out, and it was all like, you know, love songs. And, songs about heartbreak and all that kind of stuff and this is a this is this is a girl who met the man of the 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 man of her dreams when she was 13 oh wow and he was older and uh, they had a, a kind of semi scandalous relationship up in Quebec and so it's all it had always been him it had always been Renee that was the that yeah. was so she could she was singing about heartbreak well, you know, she didn't know she couldn't talk about any of these things because she hadn't lived any of that stuff. She sang it, and so we had to find things that she could talk about. So uh, we did a whole routine about her learning English because she was raised speaking French up in Quebec. And one of the things I found was she had very rich stories about her her town, a very small town called Charleville, and they were real characters in the town. But they were Quebecers. You know, they had a really distinct way of speaking English. And, and so I found a whole bunch of old Jewish jokes because I'm an old Jew. And they were all jokes that were funnier when you did them with a Jewish accent. So we had her do them with a Quebec accent. <laughs> and they're the great jokes. And they brought the house down every time she did them. And people said, oh, she's so funny. And it's because I found the thing that she could be funny with. So you, I was very, very proud of myself. Then she went to Vegas and did an act put together by Cirque du Soleil, a guy, Franco Dragon, who left, and it was all spectacle, and there was none of that. <laughs> he never connected with the audience. <laughs> so, so when you're writing for these people, you have to actually tailor everything. Yeah. You can't just give them, like, oh, here's a one-liner I it wrote is the back in 87. Word, you know, tailoring. When people ask how, how you do it, I say it's like being a tailor. It's like being a, a fabulous dress designer and you would, you know, you would not put Cher in the same dress as you would put Lizzo. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's this, it's exactly the same. They are, everybody is different that way and you have to craft the material to them. How do you get to the point where you know, like, oh, this is the essence of what I'm working towards do you well, have to spend a lot of time with them or do you well there's trial and error yeah well first you have to spend time you have to have due diligence you either have to spend time with them personally or you have to do a lot of the studying if they've if they've done performance stuff before that's been recorded that you can look at and say this will work and that'll work and i see what the, i see who this is i see who she is but otherwise you, you have to hang out with them a lot of long phone conversations often kind of do the trick, but I haven't done it in a long time because I work with people who are, have established a persona already. So I, I'm not in the persona establishing business, although I could be. Call me. <laughs> it, have you ever had anybody like just clearly whiff a joke and come back oh, at you time. for it? All the time. And some people are just, you know, like, uh, but when I say yeah, Engelbert Humperdinck and people go, who? But, oh, Engelbert I mean, was right. Time, he was very big, but he, and he had stuff he'd been doing forever, and he kept saying he wanted to do something different, but he didn't really want to do anything different. He just wanted to, to 
make it look like he was trying to do something different. So Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people, especially when you do award shows and you have actors who are not performers in the sense they don't come out, you know, you don't see Keanu Reeves live at Caesar's Palace. Yeah, that yeah. Hasn't yeah. Happened. You know, Johnny Depp hasn't gone on the road. But they, ha- if they're not playing a character, they don't, they don't know who they are when they're on stage. So you have to give them stuff that, for that brief appearance, that will allow them to get over that. And, and they won't look like a deer in the headlights or they won't come off flat and, and with no personality at all. Generally, you have to work around with whatever their task is. If they're giving the art direction award, they can have something to say about art direction. And you try and tailor it to them so that it makes some kind of sense. I hear you. And I'm sure they're very appreciative when, you, when you're able to get... When it works. That. Oh, yeah. God. When it doesn't work, <laughs> I don't know. So you you started you know fa- fairly young you did the paul lind halloween special i did that blows my I mind I, i'm writing a book about how i wrote some of the worst television shows in history actually that's not that well that is considered one of them but it's a cult show that's the reason that i bring it up is that because kiss it, it another stupid tv special <laughs> and and because of the internet and because it's halloween and everything basically that happens at halloween now is like slashers and and scary and and this is like fun like hocus pocus it's just oh, fun yeah. and so uh, which i also worked on and oh uh, my goodness and, and there, yeah and there are and there's stuff that a family can watch without you know worrying that you're going to see a, a dog disemboweled or something so, which is a big favorite of Halloween movies now. Yeah, yeah. We actually, um, okay. So, so. It was just, it was, a, you know, Paul was a, was a weird character and uh, he had a TV special deal because he was a special kind of guy. You, you brought him in for a joke and then, you know, he pulled back. That was why he was so effective on Hollywood Squares. He'd come in, he would do a line and then he would leave. And he was a, he was a flavor. That's why he never really carried a movie or a television show, but he would come in and be a special event because he was unusual. And so what, you know, he was, he was always, I mean, there was always a borderline nastiness underneath <laughs> what he was doing, which played perfect for Halloween. Yeah. He, you know, that, the nasty holiday. He kind of had like a, 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 for lack of a better term, kind of like a, a little bitchiness behind yeah. it. Yeah. But it was, it was, it was fun. He's not, like, not warm and fuzzy. Yeah, yeah. Because Halloween is not is the one place time it's not warm and fuzzy. So, was was there anybody when you when you first got into into the industry? Was there anybody that just kind of took you under their wing to kind of help you get your bearings and help you figure stuff out, or was this just you fighting the whole way? You know, it's a very good question. Nobody took me under their wing, I, but I wasn't fighting. I mean, I came in, I came out to LA with an agent and a job. So right away I was ahead of the game and I recommend that to anybody who wants to do this. Now you have the internet to showcase yourself. We didn't have that then. And so a lot of people spring up off of YouTube and, and are fully formed. So that's a great tool you can use. But I, I didn't have that. But there, there wasn't anybody I, like being incredibly forgetful. There were a lot of people who helped me along, but I didn't have like a, a, a single mentor that I could say, this was the person. I had people who I worked with. Yeah. Bet. yeah. I mean, if anybody, it was bet, except we were working together. You know, we were kids and we were working together. And, but we kept, the collaboration kept going. It's been only 50 years. 50 years. Oh my oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, but I got two vaccinations. Hey, hey. Oh, you, you, you got your second shot? Of course, I'm an old fart. We get awesome. My, my wife gets her, my wife's a teacher. She gets mm-hmm. hers on this coming Saturday and she's so fucking ready for it because she's like, those little shits. Everybody are should, awful. everybody will. <laughs> you know, it's the only way we can go back to living like, you know, mask free. I had to run into Target the other day. And I got out of my car, took off with my... That was a good idea when going to Target. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out of your car. I get into the door, and I'm like, I don't have... I felt like a jackass. And and I'm the type of person that when I see somebody walking around, like, maskless, I'm like... "Mm." I know. And so I, like, ran to the car real quick, put my mask back on. But, yeah, I felt like such a goober. Um, I know. (laughs) I love when they have the mask, but it's here. Oh, yeah, yeah. It doesn't covering the nose, just the mouth. It's like, that. Yeah. they think that's okay. <laughs> what? 
planet are they from? So have you been more productive now that you've kind of been grounded for a little while for just, you know, the, the odd thing is I'm one of the people uh, who could be productive. And so I decided to, to do that. I mean, I can sit here with no pants and write and, you know, in the place, <laughs> unless I stand up and do a Jeffrey tube and I'm okay. But between the zooming and the writing, yeah, I've been very productive. And But I, I've kind of kept it on the down low because a lot of people, up until recently, a lot of actors and musicians, they, I mean, they they couldn't work. Still, you can't work live, really. There's no theater. It's it's going to be the last thing to come back. And I, I deal a lot in that. So it's And I haven't performed any place uh, except on Zoom in a year. So it was March 12th when I, when I came back from the last gig and, every, and the world ended. So, but I've, I've managed to be productive. I've managed to get a lot of stuff written. Because was, How was your last gig? How was my, a year ago, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if, if... It was a weird benefit where everybody was kind of sitting there like, should we be here? I mean, shouldn't we be wearing masks? Shouldn't we, should we oh, be, what should no. we be doing? It was one of the, the energy was so weird. It was like, why didn't they cancel this? Why did we come? So it was a lot of people who were not happy to be where they were. And I mean, they were okay. They weren't terrible. And everything I was, I was doing was about the, the cause, the charity. I hear you. It was in Palm Springs. So it's never that, you know, high energy there. <laughs> I, I'd love to talk about your charity work in a little while too, if, if you don't mind. You you mentioned that you worked for one of my wife's favorite movies though. And can we talk about that a little bit? Hocus Pocus? Well, yeah, I came into Midlerize it. <laughs> Something I sometimes do. I, I come in to, you know, just give her, just give her some Fluff, fluff up some stuff, give her some stuff. And a friend of ours, Kenny Ortega, a mutual friend who had been a choreographer and actually was, was an assistant choreographer on a tour that Beth did, like 1976, to, to Tony, the legendary Tony Basil was the choreographer. And, uh, and so Kenny and Beth, we'd all been friends, and, and that was kind of how it came together under at Disney. I think it may have been the last thing she did under, at Disney. But he was directing it, and so he said, you know, we could use something here, a line here, a line there. Uh, so it was, it was, it, it, you know, it was a very funny script. It had been written by two people who I don't think I knew, <laughs> but that's not unusual in you know, Hollywood. Do you, do you enjoy doing punch up like that? Because like coming in and it, it's, it's almost like using baseball terms, like, you know, the yeah. pinch hitter. Like, I used, I used to, uh, I was, I was the, uh, the Thursday guy, it depended. When, when, when all the sitcoms were shot before a live audience and they were, they either worked, they shot them Tuesday nights or Friday nights. And generally, if it was a Friday show, they would do the network run through on Wednesday. The network would come back with a lot of notes. And so on Thursday, you had to do a lot of rewriting and put the stuff in and rehearse it and have the actors learn it because on Friday night, they were going to shoot it. And at that point, a lot of people on the staff were already fed up with that episode and were knee deep in the following episode that they were going to have to shoot. So they bring in fresh eyes to, to punch things up. And that was a, a lovely cottage industry. And, and unfortunately, with the, in, the 500 channel universe and the internet and all that, a lot of uh, the, uh, the ratings on everything got, went down because not as many people are watching network television. It, when it's originally broadcast as they used to. So the budgets actually had to reflect that. So they had a lot of writers on staff and they didn't have any more money to bring in punch up people. So the, every, the, the, the staff had to work it all out. It was one of those, one of the ways that they, that broadcasting became narrow casting. That's such a bummer, but. And then a lot of shows now shoot like movies, you know, they'll, they'll go out and they'll, it won't be, They'll go out and now, now the examples are eluding me all of a sudden, but, but so many of them are not shot with an audience and they have a laugh track on them. I mean, Sex in the City was the first big one, I think, that, that did that, but there are a lot of them now. And the traditional ones like Big Bang are not as prevalent as they used to be. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything that's really blowing your hair back now just as a, as a fellow writer appreciating other writers is there somebody this is there, you, no actually <laughs> I, I have to say I, I haven't i but that's i haven't really been looking yeah you know, I, yeah i yeah. love 
Fortune Femister, who's on the Keenan Thompson show, but they're giving her very little to do. Uh, she's a great big woman. She's a great big gay woman who's very butch, blonde, looks like me actually with shorter hair. <laughs> and, uh, she's very, very funny. And Keenan's show is, is just premiered and it's, I love Keenan. I think he's hysterical. It's not, I don't think it's a great show, but. I've been wanting to catch it, but at the same time, I have two kids. Alabama. <laughs> Alabama. Yeah. Alabama, man. It's so I I walked outside yesterday and yeah. last week it was 17 degrees. 80 degrees yesterday. Yeah. 80 degrees. It's the new normal. Yeah, it it's sucks. Like, you know, climate um, change. It's real. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to pull my lawnmower out next next Saturday because the the yard's already getting high. I don't like that. You know what I want to do on Saturdays? I want to drink. <laughs> so again, I'm terribly sorry. All right. We we were talking about hocus pocus about coming in and doing punch up. And yeah. now I really want to know how you came into working for the doing like the the Emmys, the Golden Globes, stuff like that. How did you get into the award show stuff? Because well, I, was, I came out here and I was writing a lot of variety television, which went away when cable came in. When I came out here, there was like big variety shows every night. Carol Burnett, Dean Martin, Mac Davis, Dolly Parton. I mean, there were all these. And so I was writing on a lot of those. And they went away and they started doing award shows because that was a way uh, to get a lot of stars into a room for less money than it cost to do an episode of Friends. <laughs> And uh, because each, you know, each one of them is getting a million dollars with $6 million to turn the lights on every week at France. And it was much cheaper to do with, you know, a salute to Oprah. <laughs> they would all show up just be in her good graces and it wouldn't cost you anything. So uh, I did a lot of that kind of stuff. And that kind of led to the Oscar show. I, the, there was a producer named Alan Carr who I worked with on a few things. And he got the job to produce it one year, and he brought me in to write it. And, and it was the infamous Snow White meets Rob Lowe year. Oh, and wow, yeah. There were lots of carrying on, but he did not survive, and I did. And I, could, I just kept doing it. I did it 23 times and, and still go in and consult and do kind of different stuff because the, the whole structure of the show has changed. This year, of course, it's entirely different like everything else. Yeah. Did, you, but, did you end up watching the, the show last night? The, uh, I did. I never, I never work on the Golden Globes, but I may have when somebody was hosting it and I, I gave them some jokes. That's possible. But I was never a, a, an actual writer over there. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, they did what they could, what, what they could do. They have to wrestle this thing where, where you have a show that that has traditionally relied on a lot of glamour and the energy of that glamorous audience, and they weren't there. Then so they had a bunch of first responders, and half is, you know, not a big crowd. And, and they weren't necessarily the people who those jokes were uh, uh, intended. I mean, you saw who the audience was when the biggest applause of the night went to Chris Maloney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's a show they all watch. They all watch and have watched SVU for 20 years. Yeah. So to be in the room with Chris Maloney was a big deal. <laughs> they, they I mean, it was really the loudest reception of anybody. That so that it was uh, tough to you know, do that that kind of energy and and I did love it. They had all these people sitting at home in in red carpet attire, sitting on the couch in the den watching the computer, to see if they if they won. I thought that was pretty funny. I mean, I didn't know that you could repeat that, and I think that the Oscars will have you know they're having a hard time. I'm sure figuring out what they're going to do. That's not that, but. You know, given the const the, the constrictions of, of the year, they did a pretty good job, I thought. Yeah, yeah. And you, you were talking about variety shows earlier. I've noticed it, it seems like a trend lately where as the sitcoms are dying, and I think people are getting more and more tired of reality TV, uh -huh. there seems to be like – primetime game shows and stuff like that oh, yeah. happening on TV. And th it seems like just due to the nature of you can watch anything you want to anytime, they're having to really scramble to figure out what to do on primetime TV. Has yeah. that led to any new opportunities for you as a writer? Well, <laughs> yeah, when they reboot Hollywood Squares, maybe. 
Uh, <laughs> although they never, it's never been off. There's a thing called Hip Hop Squares on uh, MTV Two. Doesn't oh, make really? It MTV One, and it's all rappers because they're so funny. <laughs> uh, and it's been on for a few years, and I, I guess it's cheap enough to produce. They use our old set and some of our old jokes. I've noticed. But I guess that's why. Listen, the networks are, are they're challenged as never before because they they were particularly t uh, the audience shrank because there are so many other things to watch on other platforms and people look at things on their phone. And then COVID came and they couldn't even produce what they were producing, so they had to scramble to get new content. One of the reasons why all those old game shows have been rebooted is because they are very cost efficient. You're, you spend your, your big expenditure is in building the set. Yeah. And if you build the set the right way, you don't you can build the audience into the set so you can have a socially distanced audience. And you only have a few people involved in production so that when they come on, I mean, look at Jeopardy every night. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's it's four people and and an audience that you never see. And they may not even be there. They may be in another facility watching the thing on TV and they're mic'd so that you're getting that you're hearing the reaction. So in other words, it's, uh, it's cost efficient to produce during a pandemic and, and uh, a lot of other stuff isn't, you know, it wouldn't be so easy to do the new Starsky and Hutch right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that would be, a, there'd be a whole lot of stuff you'd have to do. So uh, we think, I think that, that now what has it done for me? Uh, you know, I mean, it, nothing. I mean, there's a, a huge, there's a huge out, there's a huge world out there of platforms. I mean, everybody's buying Netflix, Peacock, Hulu, Amazon. There are all these new markets that, that, that are scooping things up, and especially in the last year. So it's presented a lot of opportunities. I, however, have, however, have nothing to plug. So, but that's not because there's no, there are no opportunities. There are, there are plenty of opportunities out there. I just haven't managed to glom on to any of them. <laughs> one one thing a, there's a certain ageism at work, you know. It's you know, I mean they, they give awards to Norman Lear and they kiss his ring and but but then, you know, somebody somebody's younger than Norman Lear doesn't get offered things because you're old. You're too you're too old for that. We have younger people who are more in tune with what with the market. But you know, I was that person once and I and I I kind of venerated a lot of the guys who went before me and the gals and a lot of people didn't. And I, I always said, no, you shouldn't, no, you should keep this person. This person is valuable and their experience is valuable. And now it's, you know, hollering into, into an empty car, empty can. I've never been called that before. Nope. An empty can? <laughs> oh, 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 just wait. <laughs> so we'll get around to it sooner or later. <laughs> So her one first because that's the only way. <laughs> as a writer, as somebody who that you have to pour your experience into what you do. Do yeah. you you seem to have done very good at keeping up with stuff? Can, can what do you do to kind of? make sense of everything happening because there's so much stuff going on especially as a comedian it seems like you have to kind of keep in touch with current events in addition to that pop culture and I, I know that watching the golden globes the other night i didn't know half of any of the people that they talked about i'm a dad i have two kids my wife exclusively watches 90 day fiance and dumb <laughs> shows like that so i there's and when I'm not doing that with her, I'm in here doing this. So uh, well, <laughs> um, what what do you do to kind of keep up with stuff? Well, I don't have any of those encumbrances. I never had a partner. <laughs> I have a 15-year-old pug who farts, and so I, that gets me out of the room. But So I've had a lot of time to spend paying attention to what's going on in the world or ignoring it as, as I see fit. And, uh, and all of that comes to play in everything that I, I write, no question about it. I mean, even when you're writing memoir, a lot of, a lot of current references get involved as well. So, you know, you just, it's like, you know, you can isolate and keep, or keep up with the times. And even the people who I read are people who, who are, are alive in the world. They're not, they're not, they haven't retreated into just pretending they're in Bridgerton. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there anybody yeah, or down Abbey before it? I mean, it's a nice thing. They're fun to watch, but 
what what turns you on intellectually like get you into a creative mode that you can go oh this is because you you have to take stuff in yeah and enjoy stuff i think it's a, you have a point of view of the world you look at something and you say well now that's that's funny and is there some is something that i can that i could do with that i mean it may spark something i mean there was i was on facebook earlier and they were talking <laughs> next door digest which is like a citizens website where people in a neighborhood like yeah, you spy on your neighbors yeah yeah <laughs> spying on your neighbors exactly right and somebody was talking about a cat was killed in a, a hit and run in hollywood and was saying and the cat was this is female and potentially pregnant and i thought what does that mean potentially pregnant every female on the planet is potentially pregnant <laughs> except the species of where the males do it and i thought if that's hysterical and i said but you know there's nothing i can do with it here because this is about a dead cat yeah no yeah one, no one wants to hear a joke about a dead cat so i have to figure out a way to work potentially pregnant <laughs> That's the. It's kind um, of like I mean, is a little bit pregnant. It's always uh, she's she's slightly pregnant. I thought no, you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. It's just none of this. Like I'm a little pregnant. No, you're pregnant. <laughs> you mean you may be in the early stages, but there's another way. That's another way of saying it. You're pregnant. It's there's like a cat in the says, box. When and... somebody <laughs> says it was, it was wait, it was very unique. No, no. It's unique. It can't be very unique. <laughs> unique means it's the only one of its kind. It's unique. Very unique is no, no, no. That you just don't. That's not it. I. I it was quite that. wonderful. No, it was wonderful. It wasn't quite wonderful. It was wonderful. I if need to take your advice. If it was this. quite wonderful. It wasn't quite wonderful. <laughs> but then I begin to sound like you know my ninth grade English teacher. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I step away from the vehicle. I you pointed out something that I'm sure I annoy the shit out of people with my Facebook posts and Twitter posts because I'm guilty of all of that and it's yeah, it's pretty egregious sometimes. But <laughs> can you egregious tell Egregious is a great word. I love egregious. I every now and then I hear somebody smart say something and I pick it up and it doesn't rub off but it, it at least gives me an interesting. So with Hollywood Squares, how did you get that in? It sounds like you had a blast. I had, it was fabulous. I got it because uh, some friends of mine, Pat Lee and Bill, uh, John Moffat, who produced Comic Relief, which I did all of, revived it. And they asked me to be the head writer. And I, uh, I jumped at it. And then they asked Whoopi if she would be the center square. And she jumped at it. And so suddenly it was like the old team was reunited. Oh, nice. Uh, and that was very fun. And Whoopi actually said, oh, I think he should, ho Bruce should host it. And they all kind of blanched. And, and but they didn't want to piss her off that early in the game. So they screen tested me. You know, and I, this is for the win, Louise. And, <laughs> and they said, well, you know, you're not quite the host th for this. But we'd like to put you in a square. So I wound up in a square next to Whoopi. And uh, for six years, I was there. And when you're on television every night, you get all kinds of weird offers. And that's what, how Hairspray came. I uh, had to I went an audition for Hairspray and did a year on the road and a year on Broadway playing the mother. I had to shave for it. I had a beard for 32 years. You had a, a glorious beard, by the I way. Had, it was. It was very it, Mare Mountain Dean. It was an incredible beard. It was, yeah, yeah. And I covered <laughs> up all of this. I covered up all of these <laughs> So I don't. I now look like Jabba the Hutt. So oh, it, covered, it covered all that up. Do you do you do you miss the beard, or are you you no. happily clean shaven? <laughs> <laughs> no, tell, I will tell you why. First of all, because it, it, I, I I didn't want it to grow in white, and so I had to keep dyeing it, and that was just like it's a frightful, a frightful, frightful procedure dyeing a beard, and and it was like you know I didn't have to. Uh, Maintain. I, mean, I I started shaving was a, is a drag, and I I start I shaved for hairspray, so it became part of my theater routine. And then when I stopped doing the show, I I forgot to shave. <laughs> <laughs> my, so I got into it. But enough people told me I looked younger without the beard. I thought, okay, I live in Hollywood. <laughs> I look younger. Okay, I'll take so it. When you did hairspray, did you ever get to chat with John Waters? He oh, is, absolutely, yeah. He fascinates friend. me. 
I knew him before that, and then we got really friendly as a result of it. Because he came out on the road with us a few times. And, yeah, and we opened the show in Baltimore, the tour, the national tour. Oh, and really? Had, That's his stomping ground, so. Uh, and he was filming, actually, the last movie he made, which was A Dirty Shame, with Tracy Ullman and Johnny Knoxville. Yes, I remember that one, yeah. And they were shooting it in Baltimore at the time, and uh, there was also a hurricane. A lot, of ha- a lot happened at once. Oh, wow. And so, so it was a big homecoming thing when the show opened in Baltimore. And yeah, I got very friendly with him, and and he is he's a trip. He's now you know he's he's one of these amazing, like a lot of people actually. And he's it's still amazing that you know there's a John Waters persona, and he but he unlike most everybody who has a persona, he almost never drops it. You know, he's like <laughs> always John Waters, and occasionally he will slide out of it. You know. I mean, when something really wonderful happens or he'll see somebody, he'll be like, suddenly, he'll be so excited, he'll forget that he has a part to play. You know, that yeah. John Waters is a character as well as a brand, as well as, you know, a performance art piece. And uh, and he will be this, he'll be this other person. He'll be this guy <laughs> from Baltimore who can't believe he's actually, you know, we're at whatever, meeting the queen, whatever it is, I don't know. But he's, 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 he's pretty, pretty amazing. He he always has a an erudite type, oh, kind of persona and also. He, I'm sorry. He oh. we did we did the uh, there was a movie made about me 20 years ago a documentary called Get Bruce, and they showed it at uh, the Provincetown Film Festival of course and I I, I was in uh, P Town performing, which we organized for the same time and John has a house in P Town, and he came to see the movie when they screened it. And, you know, it's all about how I write for this one, for Billy Crystal and for Whoopi and for Bette and all these people. And when it was over, he came over to me and he said, it was a wonderful movie. He said, you know what you should do? You could write for for uh, serial killers. <laughs> for when they when they finally get their turn in, in the in court to say to you could write the stuff that they say so they could be funny <laughs> and and warm and you could bring out the other side of them. <laughs> you know, I kind of was like, <laughs> this is before we had done hair's book. <laughs> like, like, is this, is, is he putting me on? Is this like John Waters doing a John Waters number on me? Or is this like, you know, it's just, <laughs> and it, it's almost, it's in, almost impossible to tell which is which. That's 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 amazing. He is, he is so skillful, but everything he does has like a, a tongue in cheek, wink in the eye, you know that kind of thing. He also has been one of those guys in Hollywood who has existed, you know, as very much an out gay man in a time well, when it was probably really hard to be an out gay man in Hollywood. Well, he hasn't existed in Hollywood. I mean, he's existed in Baltimore. He made all of yes. his movies in Baltimore, and he became a cult figure, and he he would come out here. He never did a Hollywood picture. They were all, I mean, as he got bigger, he got distribution by studios, but he never had to play the game. He went back and made the movie in Baltimore. In fact, it cracked him up when they made the John Travolta musical version of Hairspray based on the, the stage musical that, that I had been in. And they had to shoot it in Toronto because Baltimore was too expensive. Oh. <laughs> because of, of Union. So, and he said, hysterically, he said, I made 17 pictures here for $1.98. And now they're going to Toronto to recreate Baltimore, 1962. Rather than coming to Baltimore and just saying, everybody off the street, take down the signs, move the, the new cars. We're, we're, we're doing a period. <laughs> no. <laughs> they had to go to Toronto and do that. It amused him no end. But so, they, and I'm sure he made more money off of that movie than he made off 12 of the 17 pictures that he shot in both. It's a damn shame, too. But, I mean, get that money, dude. But I'm not worried about it. I mean, he's made a lot of money. He's a, he's a, and nobody sells John better than John. You know, he's a painter. He's, he's a writer. He's a lecturer. He does a stand-up. I mean, John's got 8 million revenue streams. Yeah, yeah. He... He's no, he's no fool. And, and as we often say, and he loves Baltimore. I mean, he, he has a place in San Francisco, he has a place in Provincetown, but he really loves Baltimore. And, and he keeps saying, nobody realizes what, a, what a, except me, he said, what a really strange, weird town Baltimore is. And 
know, when I was there, I said, well, you know, there's something about the city who, other than John Waters, the two most famous people to come out of it are Edgar Allan Poe and Cal Ripken. <laughs> so like, you know? The only thing I know of Baltimore outside of John Waters' work is The Wire. So, <laughs> and then, <laughs> then came The Wire. The yeah. Wire was on was, when I was on Broadway in Hairspray in 2004. The Wire was big on HBO. And yes, what was it? Homicide Life on the Streets? That also. I yeah, that, that came first in, the, in the, the Wire. Yeah, Craig, yeah, right, Craig right. Mason, I think is his name, the, the writer. Um, Fantastic. I can't think of his name. I know, I know him. I can't think of his name. It'll come back. So I, I noticed that you've done a lot of really, really good work for AIDS charities. And mm -hmm. that's, that's something that is like kind of near and dear to my heart. It's, it's something that my mom has consistently been, you know, has helped out with our local AIDS charity, which is the Birmingham AIDS Outreach. And it seems like you, you've done a lot of stuff. I have yeah. from the beginning, you know, because I'm that old. <laughs> well, I mean, it's you, you did it at a time when it was kind of a scary thing to talk yeah. about to anybody. Yep. People were terrified. It was a pariah. I mean, it was and it was it was framed as the gay disease. And anybody who wasn't gay, who knew somebody who was gay, kind of looked at them like this, like, hmm. Can I get this from you? You know, and I used to be sort of a joke saying, you know, you can't get AIDS from sitting on a toilet seat. There has to be another guy sitting there already. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, was, it was like that. It was the only way you could deal with it was to be funny about it. And uh, at the beginning, we realized the government wasn't going to step in. So in show business, you know, we raised money. We're very good at giving shows and raising money. So that was what I did. And it, at the beginning, it was only if, uh, a few people would do it who were not afraid. Madonna, Bette Midler, Joan Rivers, Nell Carter. These were all women, and they all had uh, personal experience with the disease with people in their circle, or family even. And, uh, and I, uh, we got into it. I would, I would call people and I'd say, look, I'll write whatever your charity is. I'll write, I'll write the show if you'll come on, on this AIDS charity show. And so that was how I got uh, acquainted with all the bigger diseases because <laughs> I was writing because <laughs> I was writing all of those th all those things. It was a bartering system just to get people. And then Rock Hudson got sick, and Elizabeth Taylor stepped in. And once Elizabeth was there, it changed the tenor of everything because now these were major personalities, and it, it it was put into the mainstream as a result. And then and in England, Princess Diana got involved. Oh, yeah, in, yeah. In the mainstream over there. She and Elizabeth were responsible for raising many millions of dollars and a lot of people's consciousness about it. And that, all of that was, you know, huge for, for you know, making effective change and getting money to the charities and getting sure. money for research. Yeah. But yeah. people like you out on the ground doing it first and at risk of your career seem well yeah was I that mean, ever a problem i don't not that i know of i mean i think that there may have been people who i think the age thing was uh, so it, maybe for a little bit when uh, because there were so many gay people and uh, even closeted gay people or were in show business where everybody knows they're gay and and i don't think that that was i don't think that that scared them away i mean gay has scared some of them away but all the time because they're you know they're just they're they're they're, they're fear of the other but i don't think i don't it it, it didn't I'm sure there was somebody who said, well, I don't want him on the staff. I'm afraid of him. He may be sick or I'm afraid of him. We know he's gay. <laughs> <laughs> there was no doubt about that. So, um, <laughs> so I was, uh, you know, I was just kind of like, I, I don't know how I presented. I was not as nearly, nearly as flamboyant as a lot of the gay guys I know. So, and I also wasn't as buttoned down as a lot of them were then, especially so. Yeah, you know, somewhere yeah. somewhere in the middle. I was very busy just being a hedonist. Well, you <laughs> like Mar like Margaret Cho says, "I'm not gay. I'm not straight. I'm a slut." Where's my? <laughs> you 
have worked your ass off. Just looking at your IMDb, oh my gosh. You, uh, you, know, you I had an agent who said you could lose the last few pages. Makes you seem very old. <laughs> I, I can't lose all of it. I mean, it's like you know, I am, I am who I am, and I, I never lied about my age. And so it's like, okay, it's all that work is there. It, so you're working on a memoir now, apparently. I'm working on a book, yeah, a book about how I wrote some of the worst TV shows uh, in history and lived. I'm working on a bunch of things. I've got a musical. I've got a whole a bunch of that, but that's one I can actually sort of talk about because I tell I tell stories about what it was like to do all these things. That that's amazing, Bruce. I don't want to take too much more of your time. I do have to go. Actually, I got to go to I have to go do a Zoom meeting. Oh gosh. Shortly. Well, I hope they don't drop you like three times like my stupid ass did. All right, they, they have, they have a, an IT guy who will be strung up. I'm a lamp and I've got to be off. It'll just be me talking to my wife, and I'll go, Bruce thinks I'm an idiot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Bruce, thank you so much. Thank Is there anything you, you want to shout out before we before we let you go? Yeah, I got nothing to plug. I'm sorry. Bruce. Sweet Home Alabama. We're, I'll sing a few bars. <laughs> you don't have to. Oh, my gosh. If okay. that song went away forever, I would be so happy. <laughs> But Bruce, it was a pleasure talking to you. It was a pleasure meeting you. And I can't wait to read that memoir because it sounds amazing. I'll be back when I have it. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. All right. Enjoy. Thanks. Bye.